Hi everyone, my name is Alex, I'm an engineer and my passion is design, development and prototype production of all sorts of engineering solutions. Welcome to episode 2 on the reconditioning of my Walter UTA dividing heads indirect indexing mechanism or in other words the reconditioning of its worm drive. From the last episode you may remember that this dividing head had a severe wear issue on its worm wheel which was caused by very nasty corrosion spots on its worm, a result of the former owners not tending the oil filling in this dividing head very much, I guess. <laughs> in the last episode we managed to regrind the worm so as to get rid of the corrosion spots completely, thereby the lens on the worm got slightly narrower, and in this episode we want to focus on machining a worm wheel replacement that hopefully not only is precise, but hopefully also fits the worm perfectly. But let's see about that in this episode. Here I have the originally installed, uh, sorry, the originally installed worn worm wheel, and a second one. And installed is obviously a third one. <laughs> and I guess you can see through this charade. The second one is the one I machined first and I made two mistakes machining it and the one installed is the good one I machined afterwards. The learning curve on machining such gears is quite steep I think and let's see about the result that I could achieve with the third one <laughs> because in the end of this episode I'd like to show you the results of the precision test of this worm wheel replacement that will hopefully allow us to call this reconditioned or good as new. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, join me. So we start off with a pricey piece of bearing bronze. It's pricey all right, since I had to buy two. <laughs> Touching off on the blank diameter and setting the tool on the DRO. Starting roughing. Ah, the boy is a bit low on the feed rate. That's better. Checking the tool diameter setting. More roughing now. and facing to have a good base for the brooch. Now comes broaching out the hole. This is good practice here since it leaves a slug of material that can be used otherwise. Yeah, nothing annoying happens in Alex's shop. Nah! So that's as deep as I can broach from this side. Then inverting the part, facing again, and broaching out the rest of the slug. Which actually fell back into my lathe spindle this time. <laughs> then roughing down the outer shape. All these surfaces have allowance yet, you'll see why later on. And lastly, we need a centering shoulder to register the angle standard. Of course, some chamfering is necessary. So that's one of the blanks I made. This one doesn't have the centering shoulder yet. Then, off camera, I made some parts like this flange nut here, which inserts like so and pulls on a piece of all thread then we have the support flange which is centered on the bronze shoulder and the theodolite base with its centering adapter that also fits into the support flange and this flange nut is sized so that it can be operated with the bronze blank already clamped, like so. 
So as to be expected with soft protection shims in a 3-jaw chuck, the radial runout is awful. Here almost 100 microns, radially. With no protection shims I usually have 10 or 20 microns radial runout in this chuck. Axial runout is quite good, should be should be roughly 10 microns. But still these runouts are unacceptable for a precision gear. That's why we have allowance on all surfaces yet. And here I'm machining the final surfaces. Firstly, the centering shoulder. And secondly, the war wheel outer diameter. So this takes care of the runout, as you can see, uh, aside of some dirt on the surface. So a sound starting point for milling. We will use these machine surfaces also later to indicate on when we move back to the lathe. But wait a minute, which cutter to use for machining the worm wheel teeth? Plain and simple, a single point cutter. And I ground that single point insert from a worn 6mm tungsten carbide end mill. Have to watch my expenses, you know. First, we cut off the remainder of the dull teeth. The diamond cutoff disc makes a quick job of this. Ain't it sweet how that diamond cutoff wheel chews through the devilishly hard tungsten carbide? <laughs> and as always, Alex didn't catch it. Next, we swap in a coarse diamond cup wheel to rough down the insert's cutting face. I wanted this insert to have neutral geometry, so we have to grind down all the way to the shank axis, so half the diameter. I'm plunge feeding here, so as to wear the wheel as homogeneously as possible. The in and out movement is only to get a feel for the adequacy of the feed rate, judged by the RPM drop that is. Checking if I'm on center, but only with my crappy micrometer, you know, the insert is just as hard as the, the micrometer anvils. Next I'm setting up for a wedge grind, so as to rough down most of the remaining material. and doing this symmetrically so as to keep the tip centered with respect to the shank. Also plunge feeding here. Now comes the interesting part, the curve or co coordinate grinding. For this task we need a diamond torus wheel. The resin bound radius 2.5 and 100mm diamond wheel is ideal for the decal debit grinder. And here's the setup. Aside of the torus wheel we need an additional extended indicator for the plunging depth. And this one is held by a magnetic base that sits on a custom machine flat spot on the grinder's housing. Here's touching off on the shank, so we know we are 3mm off center. 
I'm doing this by hand because it's more sensitive. So this is somewhere halfway, moving on to the next coordinate. So that's 2.246 local infeed. Two point two four six, and we need two point seven seven zero local plunging depth. So the indicator here has four millimeters offset, so that's four point seven seven zero. Four point. Seven seven oh. That's good. All right, moving on to the next coordinate. Here viewed from the top, you see the right hand side of the bit is already finished. The left hand side is in progress. So again, moving to another coordinate, 2.173 local infeed. feed, 2.173, uh, the boy messes up here, ah, almost. And then, local plunging depth, 1.089. Plus the indicator offset, this is 5.089, 5.089, and so on. Here is a final step, I'm relieving the very tip. And we should be done. Okay guys, we're here at the profile projector, also known as shadow graph, in order to check the shape of the single point insert that we just ground. We're looking down at the single point insert and we're using top light at the moment. I'm sorry, I have to get my head in there just for a second. Focus is good. So this is the single point insert we just ground. It's already mounted in the boring bar. Here is the set screw that holds it, and let me go to a higher magnification. This is 20 times magnified, and while looking down at the surface is quite interesting in terms of checking the surface roughness, we will switch to the backlight feature, and let me check the focus, focus is good. And this allows us to check the shape of the curve that we just ground very well. And in order to check the shape, I printed this paper template of the CAD model. And I printed it in size to fit the 20 times magnification. And so now we can go ahead and... Sorry, I have to get my head in there just for a second. And we can go ahead and check the shape of the curve that we ground and the contact patch where warm wheel and warm contact each other is from here to there from my left hand thumb to my right hand thumb if you compare the paper template with the shadow then you see that this method works out really fine and we have no problem with shape deviations however you can also see two errors the first one being that the tip of the single point insert is slightly narrower than the desired tip width this is a consequence of an error which I'm going to explain just in a second but first let's see the second error and now 
the shape of the paper template and the shadow should coincide on the left hand side and let me just move the image to coincide on the right hand side with the tip and now you can see that the single point insert is a little bit wider at the top than it is at the bottom and the error that causes this also causes the tip to be a little bit narrower than what we want this is caused by a 15 arc minute error on the right angle stop of my deco debit grinder which sets the dividing head axis perpendicular to the grinding wheel axis so I might have to address this error in the future sometime but for now I can live with this even though these two arrows might seem problematic here at the profile projector you will see in the end of this video when we check the precision of the worm wheel that this causes no issues so as always you didn't disappoint me good work old friend get off me baby <laughs> What just happened? So how did I come up with that geometry for that single point cutter and more particularly with these grinding coordinates to grind it? Well, in order to know the geometry of the single point cutter we must perfectly know the geometry of the tooth gap on the worm wheel because in the end this is what we want to machine with it. So think of this as the outer diameter of the worm wheel blank and think of this as a virtual diameter, also called the pitch diameter. This does not exist in reality, it's just needed for design. And this is the base circle of the worm wheel. We'll talk about this in just a minute. Then we need the geometry of the projected worm. Think of this here as the axis of the worm this here as the base diameter of the worm this here as the projected worm tooth and this edge here is also purely virtual and we only need this for designing the teeth so what we want is that this virtual pitch circle perfectly rolls on this edge and rolling means that there is no slipping but um, perfect friction and let's start by coinciding this point here of the projected worm onto this point here on the worm wheel blank and so now we can draw our first set of edges which begins to mark out our tooth gap shape and now we want this edge to perfectly roll on the pitch circle that means we travel equal distances here on the circle and here on that edge that's why these markings are there and now we align this virtual edge as a tangent on the pitch circle roughly like so and mark out our second set of edges for generation of the tooth gap now we go to the third one which is roughly here mark out our third set of edges our fourth one this one here fourth set fourth set of edges fifth one and so on And so you can see we came up with half a tooth shape with this very primitive method. Now we have to mirror this part to that side, roughly so. And then we have to mirror this part to that side, And this way we almost came up with the tooth gap shape except that we just have to make it a little bit more deep so that the worm does not touch the worm wheel on the worm outer diameter and then 
we get our single point cutter shape which is roughly what I plotted out on this template here. Of course this has to be slightly corrected because of the angle with which the worm wheel is pitched towards the cutting plane of this one here but this is not much. And then as we know the shape of the single point insert we can come up with the coordinates for grinding by drawing out the primitive shape of our diamond torus wheel, putting it as a tangent onto that cutter shape and note the coordinates, move it an increment further, note the coordinates, move it an increment further, note the coordinates and so on until we have covered the whole tooth shape of the single point cutter. As we mount the insert in the boring bar, we must make sure that its cutting face is parallel with the bar axis. And this is how I check the radial setting of the insert. Note that the cutting radius which I check here is not necessarily the same as the warm radius. Unfortunately, there is no straightforward method to determine the ideal radius. I determined this iteratively during the insert design. Then we must pitch the dividing head to account for the warm thread pitch angle. Here I'm touching off edge on edge since I couldn't think of a more exact way to find the warm wheel center. In this setup everything is tilted or curved, you know. Now we can finally install the dividing setup. Support plate. Centering adapter. and tightening. But I feel that's not tight enough. I guess I have to use another tool here. Yeah, watch for it. <laughs> More on. <laughs> well anyway, Next let's check the Triebrach adjustment. Its registering buttons must be perpendicular with respect to the axis of rotation. But this seems fine here. So finally we can mount our angle standard, which is my arc second accurate Wild Herbrug T2 theodolite. Now beware, this improvised or rather makeshift setup is far from a production type setup. Not necessarily in terms of precision, but in terms of simplicity and ruggedness. So let's hope I'm careful here. So we're good to go for teeth milling. First we must set the zero point, which is ok here already. And we must align the crosshair with a fixed, fixed reference target. This time I used the top of a rock formation on Winkelkopf. It has good contrast and no better suitable target was available from that location on the machine table.
So the improvised dividing procedure is as follows. Releasing the clamp, shining light onto the horizontal circle and setting the next angle increment, which is easy with 40 teeth. Then we have 10 gone increments. So in this case we're at 30 gone. All the while the optical micrometer is blocked of course. Then clamping the angle setting, moving the crosshair with the dividing head into the reference target. Then clamping rechecking target rechecking angle setting and we're good to go for another one So off to the lathe again. First we indicate the part axially and radially on the forejaw chuck on the milled surfaces. Sorry I forgot to film tight tolerance boring and facing here. So this is already step 3, turning a relief between warm wheel and clamping sleeve. Then chamfering. Inverting the part and indicating on the teeth. Then turning the clamping sleeve to final diameter. Facing to length. This step is critical since the length locates the position of the worm wheel with respect to the worm. Then back to the micron mill, machining the clamping features. Center finding. Then finding the edge of that big chamfer with a centering pin. Spotting. Drilling. countersinking and guided tapping and pitching back down to horizontal Milling the two pockets, edge finding, spotting, drilling, countersinking, 
and guided tapping again. So, the new one to the left and the worn and original one to the right. They mostly differ when you look at their teeth. Narrower gaps on the left one because of the reground worm and the worn gaps to the right. There is a roughly 15 micron press fit between warm wheel and spindle and I'm shrink fitting this. Even though every second counts here, I'm handling this really clumsily. <laughs> but what can you do? Now I must not forget this hardened shim and the rotational alignment between shaft and wheel for the clamping bolt pockets. So, checking alignment here. I guess that's a clear case of dumb luck. Here's how the tooth contact spotting turned out. One can get a slight sense that the single point insert was a few microns wider at the top of the teeth, but that's really minimal. Other than that we can see proper contact along the tooth width, which is not so easy to accomplish with an eccentrically adjustable worm gear. So it turned out nice I think. Showdown always comes last, and so does the precision test, I guess. <laughs> Here, the dividing head sets the angle, and the theodolite only measures it. So finding the reference target, locking onto the fine adjusters and guiding the crosshair into the reference target. Then reading the horizontal circle and noting the value and taking the inverted reading to assure measuring accuracy. I guess I'll spare you the 100 repetitions. <laughs> so let's see about the errors of that reconditioned worm drive. In this first graph here I plotted the errors I measured with exact increments of one crank revolution. So these errors result with the worm always in the exact same orientation. Therefore, they are only a consequence of teeth location errors on the worm wheel. Now, the errors here are within a tolerance of approximately 1.5 arc minutes. Now, the question arises, is that much or is that little? Well, this translates into a circumferential positioning error of less than 30 microns on a 130 mm or roughly 5 inch diameter workpiece. I can live with this and it's not too bad in my opinion. 
But how does my warm wheel compare to the new condition of such a dividing head as it was back in the day? Unfortunately, I don't know the inspection tolerances that Walter accepted for these units. However, I did measure the errors of my almost unused Walter round table, which has a roughly four times larger warm wheel. It's huge. And the errors I found on this one were between plus minus half an arc minute, but keep in mind the much larger warm wheel size. Given the fact that location errors on small warm wheels translate much worse into angular errors, I think I may dare to say that my reconditioned warm wheel is now good as new. Also the fact that this dividing head's direct indexing disk errors are of similar size as these here convinces me of the good as new statement. Nevertheless, if you happen to know by fact the Valta tolerances from for example an inspection sheet, please be so kind and leave a comment. But wait, that's not all. This final graph here shows the errors I measured within one crank revolution. So that's 0 to 9 degrees on the dividing head spindle. So these errors are almost exclusively caused by warm wheel tooth shape and by errors of the worm itself. That is, here we see the performance of our reground worm and of our custom single point insert. Here we are roughly within plus minus half an arc minute. So that's one third of our warm wheel tolerance or the same as the much larger Valta round table I have. I'm really happy about this, particularly because I wasn't sure how my lathe sleet screw error would affect this, but lo and behold, it's okay. As always, I hope you found the one or the other thing in this video useful. Many thanks for watching, I appreciate your time. All the best and hopefully see you next time.